Well, we're going to turn back this morning to Genesis chapter 17. Um, I want to begin by saying uh, that the more you read the Bible, the more you realize that you could never accuse it of being a boring book. It's stories, it's narrative of history is written in such a way that it weaves a very enthralling towel. And we come to one of those sections now where that's very much true. We, we, we looked previously at chapter 16 of Genesis. And you'd have to say, in terms of the experience of Abraham's life of faith, chapter 16, so far, so far in his life, was a high watermark. Because chapter 16 is one of those biblical peaks. As the Bible's narrative flows, there are times when you reach uh, certain stages where God just seems to open up on a much broader horizon all that he is doing and going to do. And chapter um, 15 very much does that as he reveals himself of the God of covenant. <laughs> The God who justifies freely by his grace through faith sinners like Abraham and speaks peace into their lives. There's a wonderful experience that is known by the Christian and one, uh, 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 an experience you need to know, if you don't, uh, of that moment when God himself speaks peace to you through Jesus Christ and says, yes, simply by believing. All your sins past are taken away. All your sins present are dealt with. All the sins that you shall commit in the future shall be washed clean. It's a wonderful moment. And yet suddenly, as we follow this narrative, we go from that peak into chapter 16. And we come into the midst of a overwhelmingly tragic domestic situation. We are confronted by the pain. Um, and as a family, um, the Woolley family that is, if I can share personally, as a family, we've known something of that. The pain of a couple united, expecting to go the way of all couples, and yet actually not allowed seemingly to have children. You see, the Bible tells its story in many layers. Uh, it tells the story of God's work of redemption, of salvation, through the lives and times of ministries of the people who believe in him. And therefore, when you come to chapter 16 and we enter into this domestic situation, uh, we need to see, by the grace of God we will, the layers that are in the story. Layers that speak about the struggles that human beings sometimes face, um, the patience. I was a bit concerned there, by the way. I thought Jess was going to nick my sermon this morning, first of all. <laughs> the, the, the patience that is needed. The struggles. So let's look into the chapter. Let's think about it this way. First of all, will you be aware that the writer wants to set before us a bit of a culture shock? A culture shock. I often wonder about this particular chapter, whether there should be, uh, in one sense, one of those, you know, those health warnings that they put on the sides of, of, of cigarettes or, on, on, or alcohol and so on. Uh, warning, you know, this, this, is, this is a chapter that could actually seriously kind of 
Well, it's different for Abraham, so damage your faith in one respect. Why is it a culture shock? Well, you know a family like this, don't you? You know a family where, first and foremost, there is a family member who's not a family member, but a slave. You know those households, don't you? You and I know those households where one member of the household can say, hey, I'll tell you what, do what you like with this person. Never mind their rights. Never mind the whole matter of sexual exploitation. Never mind the matter that actually here is a human being with dignity. No, just take this woman and because we can't have children, Abraham, you take her and you lay with her and you actually, hopefully, will have a child by her. You know a family like that, don't you? No, of course you don't, do you? And even in our very confused society today, a very fragmented society, that there's a sense in which there's a degree of culture shock here, isn't there? That such a thing should be recorded. Now, it's important to remember that I, this is a culture shock. Um, archaeologists have dug up a clay tablet uh, in what we recognise today as modern Iraq. Uh, it's dated in the latter part, or sorry, the early part of the 18th century BC. And on this tablet, it records how uh, it is socially and legally absolutely fine in that particular culture for a man to be given his wife's maid and to do with her as he pleases. That's a culture shock, isn't it? But here's the even bigger culture shock. This isn't just a man and woman living during the second millennium BC. This is a man and woman who profess faith in God. This is a man and woman who would have understood that the God whom they worship had established a very clear plan for the good and the well-being of the human race. When he categorically said, didn't he, to the fir our first parents, that for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and the man and woman shall be one flesh, i.e. a monogamous family relationship. And here is this man of God, this woman of God, engaged in these activities. What's the point of this telling us? Well, I think the way we need to understand it is this. That first and foremost, it's, it's an encouragement in this respect. Uh, and I thought, how can we illustrate this? And then I, I, I walk in the dog on Friday, it suddenly hit me. Of course, now I don't know what it's like in Swansea, but in Cardiff, you cannot walk down the street at the moment and as you go past in the curbs or in the alleyways, for, for, you know, for reasons what we're, we're doing at the moment, they're just weeds everywhere. Uh, because they're not spraying and so on, yeah? And you walk down, I'll take my dog out, I'll go out my back alleyway, and, and it's almost like, you know, fighting your way through a, through a, through a grasslands. And, and you walk down the road, and in the curb, there's weeds springing up everywhere. It's a wonderful testimony to the genius of God's creative activity in the life of a seed, isn't it? And I think that's a wonderful illustration that speaks to you and I, which comes out of this passage about the beauty of believing faith in God. That quite simply, it doesn't matter what the culture is. It doesn't matter what the moral degradation may appear to be. God is able to spring up from such situations and backgrounds that living faith in him as the one true God and Saviour. 
I, I read a little like you do. And friends in the missionary world tell me that uh, there is seemingly an incredible movement of men and women coming to faith. Funny enough, it's related to this, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. Those seeds, those little plants springing up. And, 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 and that's kind of something that's very much coming out here. And, 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 and why is that? It's simply because in the layers of this story, this is not just about the pain of infertility. And that in itself is, is something that, that is, it is, you know, to for, see a couple go through. Um, yeah, I have to say, from my own observations, it, it's, it's distressing. But actually, something's bigger here. Because the faith of this man and woman was in this. That their God had said to them, I am going to give you a promise. A promise that is built upon who I am, and what I am going to do. And the promise is simply this, I am going to make you parents of a great nation of people. And in order to do that, of course, you are going to have a child. And at 86 years of age, and Sarah, Sarai being passed in her own understanding the time of childbearing, she says to her husband, hey, I tell you what, why don't you take my maid, Hagar? And I think it was probably this. We've got to have a child. It's got to come somehow. Well, then why not this way? It's a culture shock, isn't it? In all, it's, a, it's a culture shock in terms of a society. It's a culture shock in terms of the way a human being is being treated. It's a culture shock spiritually as we think about what God was doing in the last of these people. So let's come to a second thing, okay? And that's what I want to call face folly. Now that might come as a bit of a surprise to, you, to some of us. But faith in Jesus Christ does not mean that the one who possesses that faith can sometimes make unwise and foolish decisions and choices. And here we have, in the life of Abraham, in his long journey home, this life of faith and trust in God's covenant promise an act of folly you see the one thing we're taught as Christians aren't we is that, that, that when, when we receive the gift of God's uh, sorry God's gift of faith in Jesus it's not something that's static it's living it grows it grows because by the grace of God, we, we use it, we exercise it, we, 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 we trust God in his promises, we, we, we do certain things because God's called us to and we believe that's the right thing to do. And, and that's the way faith grows. But actually there's, there's a very important way that faith grows too that's a little bit harder for us sometimes to hold on to. And that's how the Apostle Peter, when he writes his first letter, he puts it like this. He says, do you know, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold is tested or evaluated or examined. And here is God testing Abraham and Sarah's faith even in the circumstances of their domestic situation. Now, I wonder if you believe that this morning. I wonder if you believe, my dear brother or sister, that such is the greatness of your love, of God, your, your God's love towards you, that he has said, you know, I know exactly your particular personal domestic circumstances. 
And do you know what? Such is my love for you that even through those circumstances, which sometimes can be so trial, such a trial and so painful, I am going to prove to you that I can fulfill my promise. Because the Christian faith isn't something that's about a building. It's not about kind of certain, it is about those things. It's not about just a, uh, a certain lifestyle. It's about this God saying, you are my people, I am your, your God, and I will be with you, and I will work in you and through you wherever you are. And even in the midst of all the kind of the hustle and bustle and ups and downs, the joys and, and the, the heartaches of family life, I will be with you and I will fulfill my promise. But Abraham, Abraham and Sarah have a dilemma, don't they? Now, what kind of motivated their response to this dilemma was, we can, we'll look at that. But the dilemma turned into a problem. And the problem can simply be summed up like this, can't it? Abraham and Sarah couldn't be patient in waiting for God to fulfill his promise. Do you notice how the writer emphasizes that in verse 3? It says that, um, <clears throat> is it verse 3? Sorry, after 10 years, after 10 years in the land of Canaan, 10 years waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. Um, in exasperation? Yeah, I, that's understandable, isn't it? I, who, 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 who of us could say as Christians, well, you know, we'll be in the same boat. That ten years of waiting. I'm getting older. And exasperation. So this kind of suggestion is made. But the problem is this, isn't it? The problem is that there's frustration at waiting on God's promises. One of the great reaffirming, reoccurring themes in the Christian's book of song, and in other parts of the Bible, but in the Christian's book of song, is the call of faith to be held with patience and waiting. Psalm 27, wait on the, on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard me. Psalm 62, my soul waits silently for God, from him comes my salvation. And then the writer, the Psalm 69 says, it puts it this way, my eyes fouled while I waited for God. I, I, I almost gave up waiting for God. And then that, love the way he puts, it's put by David in Psalm 130. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who wait for the morning. Do you know, I want to suggest to you that the... the, the, the um, the pinnacle of faith's trust in God in waiting is beautifully explained to us in the words of Habakkuk, if we can bring them up. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the yol is foul and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and no, be no herd in the store, yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You see what the, the Habakkuk's saying in the midst of his circumstances? I, 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 it doesn't seem as though God is going to fulfill his promise. It doesn't seem as though God is actually with me and, and everything seems to be turning to dust in my hands. But I will, I will. He's saying, I will wait. But in this particular case, poor Abraham and Sarah... Thanks, Jess. Couldn't. And they make the decision. Let's take Hagar. And, and, and you have to ask this moment, don't you, as someone who's a believer, what's the thinking here? What moves them to kind of 
give up waiting uh, uh, and make this decision? Well, I'd say there's two things. First of all, there's a rationalisation which isn't always helpful in the life of faith. Someone described, someone described ration, being rational or rationalisation as this. Rationalisation is a device, a self-satisfying device, that gives an incorrect reason for one's behaviour. You can see the logic here, can't you? Sarah's saying, look, Abraham, you're getting older, I'm getting older, I, I'm really not sure we can have children anymore. Well, well you know, let's... Let's give God a helping hand in making sure this is done. I almost wanted to preach on that alone this morning. My friend, if you're not a Christian this morning, do you know you live by this motto? Do you know this? You seriously believe that somehow the almighty God of love and grace and power needs a helping hand. There's something you can do to bring about your salvation. There's something you can add somehow to make sure that God's going to get it right. And, 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 and this particular moment, poor Abraham and Sarah are in that. And you notice the snag, don't you? You notice the snag. Because they do that, And look at the words of verse 4. Um, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Now some translators put the other way that Sarah despised. But the point the writer's making in this rationalisation and this choice they made, it came with complications, it came with baggage. It came with suddenly in this little kind of domestic circle, there was friction. There was, well, despising. Not a very pleasant word to use, is it? You see, we, we could ask this question, really. Is this, is this true, this question? God helps those who help themselves. Is that a true statement, question? Well, is it true? Well, I'd, I'd, I would say to you, a, a Christian response, a biblical response is, in the matter of salvation, absolutely no. But in the matter of living out my life by faith, according to Apostle Paul, I am to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. But in the fundamental matter of salvation, which rests upon God's promise, God's promises alone in Jesus, absolutely no. The eternal God, the mighty God, does not need a helping hand. Or as one writer puts it, as I read this week, that, you know, God doesn't need to use our human ingenuity to fulfill his purposes. It's almost because of that that, that, that we'll see, God willing, in a couple of weeks, the words that be open up um, the chapter 17. There's a huge jump in time between the events of chapter 16 and chapter 17. 13 years. 13 years. We'll, we'll, we'll open that a bit more, but it's to do with this, this failure on their part. You see, what chapter 16 sets before you and I as believers is this. It sets before us the age-old dilemma of face folly. That... Faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ saves. Works doing it our way in our time and our uh, in our purposes when we choose does not work. There's an there's a a, 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 a black and white, a dark and night antithesis between faith in God's promises for salvation and works. They just don't come together. But 
Faith, once possessed, leads to a Christian wanting to do the right thing, to live as God wants them to live, i.e. works. And here is Abraham and Sarah getting confused, really, about an issue. And the issue is God's methodology. What method had God given to them to follow as his people in having children? To believe the promise. To patiently wait to believe the promise, to remember that that fundamentally meant actually you can't give God a helping hand. You can't hurry on God's timing and purposes. And oh, isn't that sometimes, isn't that sometimes so frustrating? But actually faith says, faith says, Lord, you've given the promise. I wait upon you. <laughs> Let me put it in this way, in, in, in terms of an adage. God is never more glorified in your life and mine when we, with patient endurance, trust him for what he has promised to do, even though we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why this particular incident is just, it's the writer saying, do you know what? Even the father of the faith, Abraham, knew a time when he fell into faith's folly. Am I okay? Let's lead to a third thing. Oh, no, not four, three. I can't count. Sorry, three. Third, let's lead to a third thing, okay? That's in this incredible chapter. And this is the most exciting bit, really. The Lord of the Covenant. The Lord of the Covenant. So you can imagine the scene, can't you? There's friction. There's Hagar. She's expecting. And clearly Sarah's aware of that. And the friction starts. And what does Hagar do? understandable isn't it she runs she runs and then you come to verse 7 uh, in the narrative um, she fled and, and one of the commentators makes this point which is interesting it doesn't seem does it from the narrative that Abraham or Sarah knew or cared that she'd gone it's an interesting thought that but look at verse 7 then the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring. The angel of the Lord. Now, here's one of those, as we've seen on a couple of times already in the life of Abraham, here's one of those first mentions. Here is the first time that this particular character, or person, sorry, that's a better word, person, the angel of the Lord is mentioned. Now, the Bible is full of the ministry of angels. Um, they're messengers. Uh, the, the New Testament writer to Hebrews tells us that, that they're messengers that are sent out to look after and to care for God's people. But this is the angel of the Lord. Now, just notice the way the narrative very subtly but very clearly points a couple of things out about this person. Look at, at verse 10. The, the way the angel speaks, the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. I will. Now who gave them the promise of the descendants? God did. And here's the angel using the language of deity. I will 
make your descendants. And then look at at, at verse 13, Hagar's response. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. But we told an angel, an angel of the Lord spoke to her. She says, the Lord who spoke to me. And then look at the narrator's comment in verse 13. He goes on to say, For she said, I have seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer La Haroi. In other words, the angel's language, Hagar's response, the narrator's response is saying, this is, this is not just simply an angelic messenger. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever in the Old Testament you see that term, and you notice even the word Lord is in capital letters, emphasising the name Yahweh, Jehovah. Whenever you read that title, the angel of the Lord, the response of those who receive that messenger or that character is always the same. Here is a person far greater than any angelic being. Here is our Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form entering into the lives of ordinary men and women, establishing God's purposes in this very unique way. Now the question we need to ask at this particular moment is why? Why is this runaway slave in her distress, why does the angel of the Lord, our Lord Jesus, why does he appear to her? I'm going to suggest to you three things. One, because of what is at stake. What is at stake here? It, 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 It includes this poor woman in her situation. She needs comfort and she needs help. But she's part of a bigger situation, isn't she? And what is at stake here is this, it it is, he, he appears because at this moment the emphasis needs to be made that God will not fail to establish his purposed promise to Abraham. Do you remember how he speaks of himself in Isaiah 42? The Lord says this, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I will not give to another. And at this particular moment, Hagar needed reminded, and as she was being reminded, Abraham and Sarah would be reminded when she went back, that this God will not break his promise. And even now the divine second person, the Son, comes in person to emphasise that to her and to us. But here's the second reason. Why does he come? Because he's emphasising, of course, that God's covenant is a covenant of unmerited, unending, unfailing grace. Abraham, you've really messed up. Sarah, you've really pulled the trigger now and you've shot the wrong bow. That's a, that's a big metaphor, isn't it? Sorry. You shot the wrong gun. You try to rush God on. You try to, to, to push it and do it yourself. Oh, no, 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 no. Maybe you failed. But this is about God's promise that he will accomplish and in his grace fulfill in your lives. Do you sometimes feel in those situations where you, 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 just, you just know somehow that you think, Lord, I've really let you down here. I've really, I've shown a lack of faith. I, 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 we, we, yeah. Well, hey, join the club. <laughs> join that wonderful club of men and women who are, have been saved by God's grace and are being saved by God's grace and are reliant upon God and upon God alone who picks up all their failures, who picks up all their heartaches and their pains. God knew Hagar's pain. He was utterly sensitive to an unenviable position. And here he comes 
and he emphasizes to her his care and his loving grace. And in doing so, of course, that will be relayed, as we'll see, back into the life of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. But he came to thirdly in this appearance to reiterate God's covenant promise and the methods that he uses. Do you notice the way he speaks to Hagar? He tells her to go back and submit. To go back and wait. He emphasizes to Hagar that as she goes back, that she's to patiently wait. Then the writer to the Hebrews kind of hits you and I right between the middle of the eyes, doesn't he, when he says to us in, in, in chapter 6, he says of his letter, Believer, he says, don't you remember, through faith and patience, you will inherit the promises. Return, Hagar. Submit and wait. And that's what God does to us as his people when in those times we think that somehow we can help him along a bit. Or somehow we get a, our, faith, our faith gets a little bit fragile around the edges about waiting for God to fulfill his promise. The Lord Jesus comes afresh through the ministry of his spirit, through his word, and says to us, hey, do you know what? Just keep patience, keep waiting, keep trusting. Because there is an inevitable, unbreakable march of the divine purposes through the history of the world, through the circumstances of your life as you trust in him that will lead you to that place where the promise is fulfilled. Please forgive me, dear sister. Your dear beloved husband, David, has just found that promise fulfilled during the days of this week. So many years patiently waiting, so many trials, so many troubles, so many times when you doubted, like all of us, and there it is fulfilled. Let, let, let me end, let me end with this story, okay? Let me end with this story. One of the great missionary movements of the 19th and 20th century was the China Inland Mission. The China Inland Mission was begun by a very simple man, but a man of profound faith called Hudson Taylor. And what began as one man with a burden to take the good news of Jesus to the people of China uh, blossomed and grew to an incredible work uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, right up and, and beyond to, to the time of the revolution in China. But what is not known a lot about Hudson Taylor is this, that at the age of 23, he set sail for China. Six years later, at the age of 29, he was back, utterly exhausted, broken. And um, I can feel this, I tell you, because of where I come from. He spent the next five years of his life in that wonderful, salubrious part, and believe you me then, in, in, then it was, that wonderful, salubrious part of the world called the East End of London, for five years, he was almost hidden away before he returned. 
Here's how one of the people who wrote about his life describes that. Let me read this to you about him. Shut up to prayer and patience, as he was. Yet without those hidden five years, with all its growing and testing, how could the vision and enthusiasm of youth ever have been matured for the leadership that he was to exercise? The deep, prolonged exercise of a soul that is following hard after God, the gradual strengthening of a man called to walk by faith and not by sight, the confidence of a heart cleaving to God and God alone, which pleases God as nothing else can. Waiting. Frustrated, but waiting and patient. And those five years, he returns. um, And the rest is an incredible, an incredible story. It's it's, it's just a wonderful example of of, of why this chapter is here, okay? Uh, And and even though Abraham and Sarah kind of trip up here, God's got them. And he holds them. And we see in the next chapters the ongoing story. So let me end by saying this. Do you see God in life's ordinary moments? Do you see God as you walk through your mistakes? Or are you caught up in the lie? that God only operates in the spectacular, the extraordinary, or through moments of great obedience. Because this chapter says to you actually, hallelujah, praise the Lord, he doesn't. He works for our weaknesses and our impatience and, and our wrong choices and says, so I, I, I use it this way, I've got you. I've got you back. There's no way that I'm ever going to let you fail. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you again this morning for this beautiful story, so human, so full of what we recognize is true of us, But oh Lord, what a beautiful story is. It speaks of your covenant faithfulness, of your patience with us and your commitment to fulfill the promises that you give. Thank you that uh, we can see that in the life of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. And we ask, Lord, that we may with great joy and thankfulness be able to leave this place this morning trusting in our great God through our frustrations sometimes through our questions through Lord even sometimes our unbelief but how we praise you our God that you are for us and our dear Lord Jesus you have given yourself for our salvation and as one of your sheep Hearing your voice, we know that you will never let us go. We thank you then, in Jesus' name. Amen.